Welcome to the Fracking Farmhouse. I'm David Kesterman and this is the first of hopefully a number of podcasts we're going to do. A couple of weeks ago we had a debate, myself against Tom Pickering in Eccleston Civic Centre and the debate was does fracking have a role to play in the British energy mix? Shale gas. And as part of that debate we both had a 10 minute presentation and my 10 minute presentation had a couple of technical problems um, and I kind of overran a bit and I had to rush at the end. So we thought myself and Mike that we'd, we'd put it to, down to video. So hopefully I'll do it right this time. So here we are in the fracking farmhouse. Does fracking have a role to play in the British energy mix? Or shale gas, why bother? Um, okay, that's a bit of a statement. So. My first report that I present to you is the Gas Security of Supply. This is pr produced by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in October of this year. It's still warm, it's only two months old. And this looks at the problem which we were given as the initial reason why we needed shale gas, why we needed fracking industry, was to keep the gas running just in case Russia turned the taps off. And it looks at various scenarios um, of interruptions to our security of supply. And, and it basically summarises in 23 succinct pages that we have a resilient gas supply. Um, it will survive multiple failures, infrastructure and supply failures and cold weather, which we all had all of recently, a couple of weeks ago, to prove. There was no interruption to, to supply and we do not need new indigenous sources of gas to keep the gas flowing. It won't make our gas any cheaper. And there's one paragraph in it, on page 19, it talks about shale and the, the language it uses is so dismissive. It says the government believes that shale gas and the government is optimistic about this. But in order to get a conservative um, response it assumes no shale gas in the forecast period okay so according to the government's own papers in the next 20 years we will have safe secure supply of gas and supply gas without shale gas the next thing published the same month was the clean growth strategy also published by the government with a forward from our from our strong and stable leader, the Prime Minister, um, and she talks about determined to leave our natural environment a better place than we found it, and things like this. And it deals with Britain's energy future, our carbon dioxide emissions per sector, and it talks about all the positive things that will come from transferring to a low carbon future. By developing the new technologies, the high skilled jobs that will be created the hundreds and thousands of jobs that will be created and are being created by pursuing renewable energies and alternative futures than the ones we're on now. 173 pages long. Where do you think shale gas fits in with this? It doesn't. Published in October this year, 173 pages of British growth and energy policy and not one mention of shale gas in the whole document. I would be worried if I was in your or shale gas development company. But next report, oh and it, it goes on about the need to increase the pace of decarbonisation using alternative forms of gas. The next report is the future energy scenario for which I've got some here um, which was published by the National Grid. And this is a very technical document, lots of graphs and things like that. And it looks at um, different scenarios, but this is by the national grid. This isn't politicians, this is the people who actually keep the lights on and make it work. And they look at different future scenarios, whether we have steady state, slow progression, two degrees scenario, which means that we keep global warming below two degrees, or a consumer led thing where new technologies become that cheap and better than old technologies that the consumer power leads the way forward. And 
Um, and you'll see from these graphs here, there's four graphs, in all the scenarios, gas use goes down markedly. And if you look at the two degree scenario, which is the green line, gas use falls off dramatically. And does it mention shale? Yes. In the two worst scenarios, the steady state and the slow progress, it mentions shale. But in the two better scenarios, better for our future, better for our economy, better for our life, our health, and everything, shale gas is not needed. So you've got the national, you've got the government saying we don't need shale gas, you've got the national grid saying we don't need shale gas. And one further um, thing which I've got in here, which is a Northern Energy Strategy, also published in October of this year. And this is a think tank of um, academics and business people and very respectable people here. And they're looking at future energy scenarios in this country. And they talk about maybe using hydrogen as a substitute. You can split water into hydrogen and oxygen, use hydrogen as a methane substitute, maybe. But it also talks about tidal and marine, it talks about nuclear and it talks about different forms of energy storage from the um, fluctuating renewables, such as PV and solar. Does it mention um, shale? Yeah, it does. Quite a long way in, and very dismissively, it says that shale gas has garnered considerable um, opposition from environmental groups. Um, and that's true. And it may be too environmentally risky to proceed with, but it also says that it will, shale gas should only proceed with advances in carbon capture and storage, of which we have seen none. So according to this thing, we should not be pursuing a shale gas future. So that's why bother. That's shale gas why bother. So the next section of this presentation is why we mustn't, why we mustn't exploit shale gas. And the four reasons I give here are climate change, the industrialisation and infrastructure required to develop it, the health impacts of developing it, and the social licence, which at the moment doesn't exist. Climate change. As a gardener, I can tell you, and you'll see from this graph, that in recent times, the, um, since about the 1980s, 1990s, the, the temperature of the, of the planet has gone up remarkably and it is speeding up and if you look right at the far end of this graph in 2015 the leap in temperatures 2015 was the largest leap we have ever seen between two years 2015 was the hottest year ever 2016 was hotter it's looking like 2017 might come slightly in between those two but 17 of 16 of the last of the hottest 17 years have happened since the year 2000 climate change is undeniable it's happening fast it's accelerating and if you look at this graph, which shows, because it's been driven by atmospheric CO2, and you'll see from this graph, which goes back from 1700, how it's been developing slowly, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, and from the 1950s onwards, it's increasing at quite an alarming rate. But everybody says, oh, it's just a cycle, it'll come back down again, won't it? Well, if you look back over the last 800,000 years, which we're able to do with, um, ice core data, if you look at this graph here, you'll see the, site, the cycle that has been going on over the last 800,000 years between yeah, 180 and at most 300 parts per million. It's now right there. That is actually the graph there on the right hand side going right up and crossing that horizontal line, 404 parts per million. And that level is not going to go down. It's still going up and it's not going to go down anytime soon. That CO2 will last in the atmosphere for hundred years or so. So we are faced with a growing, a, a, changing, a changing climate and a warming world and this is not good, this is not something we have lived through yet. And but you'll see on the news hurricanes, wildfires, floods. To me as a gardener it's, it means things like this. This stuff, I took this photograph on the day of the debate and it's a bunch of daffodils, we call it Herbert's daffodils, they're growing in our kitchen garden. And in 2015, I saw crocuses flowering before Christmas. The crocuses that used to flower in February were flowering in December. These, I've been watching these daffodils for the last 20 years. They're always the first daffs out, so you watch them because they're great. And it's usually early March, and just before the main daffodils come out on the garden. 
and there they are nearly in flower on the 7th of December. And I'm recording this on the 20th of December, which is the day before the winter solstice. It was over 10 degrees today. We had wild honeybees foraging in the garden today. We've got there's a there's a nest in the hall that's been there forever. And the, these bees were out today and near the shortest day. I can see climate change happening and it's caused by exploiting fossil fuels. We mustn't go after a new set of fossil fuels. And in order to get fracking, we look at industrialization because in order to get fracking, to get shale gas out, the fracking process is so energy intensive. You have to drill so many holes, so many well pads. If you look here at the planning application that I have Ineos provided us with, this is the well, this is the traffic associated with the well that they want to drill at Bramley Moor Lane, just two miles from here. And you'll see just to construct the well pad, you've got um, over 2,000 HGV movements down country lanes just to build the well pad. And then when you come to the drilling phase, if you look at this drilling phase, which takes three months, they've got to drill for three months to get down because the shale is 2.4 kilometres down. So you've got to drill for three months just to get to it, 24-7 for three months. And that phase, there's 1,254 HGV movements greater than 32 tonnes. Massive arctics down country lanes, just in the drilling phase for an exploratory well. If you're going to ex develop a gas field, you need hundreds and hundreds of wells. Um, and you need to connect them with pipelines and you need compressor stations and all this infrastructure to get something out of the ground that we don't want and we don't need. Um, there's a picture of one of these trucks trying to get to Kirby Misperton. That's with a work over it. That's smaller than some of the trucks that they need to get through to Bramley Moor Lane. Um, our community cannot stand it and when you realise it's unnecessary. And the other thing then is health. Um, and you know this experiment in shale gas is happening now in Pennsylvania and there are health effects. It's trying to be covered up. There are, they're very litigious, the um, gas companies, and they're, they're, they try to shut up the GPs, but the GPs met, met and 300 of them just last October a year October ago, voted unanimously for a monitorial fracking on health grounds. But I hear you say, what about the June 2014 Public Health England report that says fracking is safe? Well, I revisited this, I read this last week, and um, it says that managed correctly and perfectly, the aerial pollution that's released from a fracking rig should pose no danger to health. It only looks at the aerial pollution from the fracking rig. It doesn't look at the health impacts of the traffic, of the wastewater that comes out, of, of any accidents happening or anything like that, of the noise. It doesn't look at any of that. It only looks at the air pollutants. And that's in June 2014. And that is the only thing they, they, they cite that says it's safe. It just isn't safe. Experience says that where they're doing it in Pennsylvania, there are very, very few people. There's, Pennsylvania is the size of the UK. It has a population of 12 million. The UK is up 52. And of those 12 million, 9 million of them live in the cities. So the countryside where the fracking is going on, it's virtually uninhabited. You cannot do that in North East Derbyshire, South Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, Lancashire. The places they're proposing fracking are far too densely populated for this to be done safely. And social license is another reason you mustn't do fracking. Once people realise that it's unnecessary, but that it's dangerous, that it's hugely disruptive to local communities, the more people realise, the more they vote against it. And when you see the government pushing something through against the will of the people, realise that only 52% of the people say they want out of the EU, and we see the massive fiscal change. When, um, when you see this pie chart, 86% oppose this planning application with zero supporting it. That's because this is from the INEOS planning application, um, showing zero local support. These are people that have been to their presentation, just leaving the presentation, they've persuaded 0% of the locals to support it. If you go to nationally, about 17%, which is financially support, compared with 73 or 74% of people that support renewable energy. So 
you cannot push against the will of the people like this. Fracking will fail. Is there another way? Yes, there is another way, thankfully. Thankfully, there is. And this is what's so frustrating. All the solutions are out there. We just need to act on them. Um, there's a report from the Energy Bill or Evolutions that suggests that if you insulate 6 million homes, take the poorest 6 million homes and insulate them, you will save um, 4.95 billion pounds in savings. You will cut gas imports by 25%. That would mean no LNG imports, um, because that's only about 18% at the moment. Um, you will get more tax revenue and people will live in warmer homes. So let's start with insulating before we even look at fracking. Um, locally, looking at renewables near here, if you look at Blackburn Meadows, you'll see from the M1 as you go over Tinsley Viaduct, um, that big black building, that's burning waste wood. Um, and in your report says, oh, so there's virtually no renewable energy in winter. This thing generates heat and power. The heat goes into Sheffield Falls Masters and the Sheffield Arena. So it's heating people, it's generating electricity. But in the foreground, you'll notice these things only came online this year. It's 10 megawatts of battery storage. And batteries have become so cost effective now, they're building 4.9 or 49 megawatts at Barrow in Furness and at West Burton. The future is here now and it's happening now for that. Um, in Telford, this Lycos distribution centre has got 3.4 megawatt of um, solar on the roof. They're just installing a 5 megawatt battery to work alongside this. The future is happening now, clean renewable energy. There is no need to burn gas to produce electricity. But if you do need gas, methane, you could look to BioSNG, which is the national grid here is at the forefront of a green gas revolution. Um, waste tips give off methane. They give off a lot of methane. You can harvest this, you can clean it, you can put it in the grid. They are doing so at Stavely, just over the road from here. Um, so this methane is not difficult to get hold of. It's globally abundant. And there's green gas, ecotricity of pushing green gas. They've got the first green gas mill where you harvest grass and then you by anaerobically digest it and you get methane out. They reckon that if you have 5,000 of these green gas mills running, that it would provide 80% of the domestic need for heating homes. Um, you say, oh, 5,000, that's quite a lot. Well, they've already got one running. There is not one productive shale gas well in this country and you'll need more than 5,000 shale gas wells to provide a fraction of that amount. So there is a future. You know, there is a real positive future if we embrace the new technology and not the old technology. So in sum, um, Lord Adair said just in November, you know, just last month, he says a near total renewable energy system is within reach with the advances in PV, in wind, a PV is um, photovoltaic, sorry, that's solar panels, and wind power and most, more importantly of all battery technology. He says that nearly, I think, 85 to 90 percent renewable electricity by 2035 is looking ludicrously conservative. There is a bright future just around the corner. So, in summary, I would like to say that we should use the decline in North Sea gas as a stimulus to do something better, not an excuse to do something worse. I move that shale gas does not have a role to play in Britain's energy mix. Thank you for watching and if you like this video, please share.